All set, John? Good evening. I'd like to call to order this regular meeting of the Boston Spa Central School District Board of Education for March 15th, 2023. Can we all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everyone who is here in person, those watching on the live stream from home. For those of you who are here in the library, in case we have to evacuate, the exits are behind me in each corner, going outside, and the exit into the hallway um, at the, the front of the library that most of you came in. First up tonight is recognition. And first, I just want to mention um, and a reminder that there is so much information about the wonderful events and activities that are happening in our district, available on the various um, Twitter feeds for the district, for all the schools, for the clubs and athletic teams, and on our district website, and in the Scotty's Recap, which is available on the district website. Uh, just so much is going on within our district, which is wonderful and needs to be called out. And just since our last meeting in the last two weeks, I just want to touch on a few things, which by no means is, um, is an exhaustive list. But our Odyssey of the Mind teams competed in the regionals. Six of those teams are going on to a New York State competition in April. The Pops concert this past Saturday had over 700 audience members, hundreds and hundreds of students involved. Um, in total, over a, a thousand people were part of that and it was um, incredibly successful. March is our Pick a Reading Partner, also known as PARP Month, and the uh, Schools have various activities, um, very much in partnership with our, our PTAs. Somewhere in there, there was School Social Work Week. One of our high school athletes, Isaiah Hanna, competed in the Nike Indoor Nationals meet and placed eighth against a nationwide field in the 60 meter hurdles. Our unified bowling team wrapped up another successful season. That's a wonderful, um, wonderful uh, opportunity for our students. And um, kindergarten information night occurred within the last couple of weeks for parents and caregivers, guardians for our incoming kindergartners. So again, that's just a sample of it. You can find out all that sort of information on the Twitter feed and our district website. And now for recognition from the district. Uh, so tonight we have the cast and some crew from Mean Girls, and I will have Mr. Lopez come up to give us some more information on that show. You guys are in single file. <laughs> so this is a small portion of our cast, crew, and pit of Mean Girls. Um, we have an amazing production team, uh, myself, Matt Lopez as the director. We have Mr. R down there. He is our pit director. Miss Chamberlain, our vocal director. Joining us this year, we have Mr. Bailey from the middle school is part of our tech, uh, designing our lights and sound. We have uh, Miss Livingston, who's over here at the high school. She's doing our our set construction and design that. And then we have Sarah Kinney from the middle school helping with our choreography and she also directed Matilda. Uh, and it's really wonderful to collaborate with all these teachers that are in house uh, and the kids are definitely benefiting from that. And so without further ado, I'll hand it over to the kids. Um, hi, my name is Ben Ferrara and I play Damien Hebert in Mean Girls. Um, we just wanted to give a special thank you to um, Dr. Duca and Mr. Murphy for allowing us to do this show. They have been great supporters of the arts and always believing in us and pushing ourselves to be better. Um, thank you again. We just wanted to say thank you. This is Maddie Burns. 
Hi, my name is Maddie Burns, and I play Katie Heron in Mean Girls the Musical. Mean Girls follows Katie as she goes from being homeschooled, living in Africa, to going to a real school for the first time. The first people that befriend her are Jana Sarkeesian, played by Fiona Hughes, and Damian Hubbard, played by Ben Ferrara. And after Katie is noticed by Janice's ex-best friend, Regina, played by Rachel Camilli, and her friends Gretchen, played by Katie Bonanto, and Karen, played by Samantha Zavadil, uh, Janice decides to exact revenge on Regina using Katie. The story continues as Katie navigates life in high school for the first time and learns about the dynamics created by cliques and what it means to be a real friend. And now I would like to introduce you to Rachel. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Camilli and I'm playing Regina George. Um, so some common themes in Mean Girls um, are the cliques in the beginning and how that um, deals with real high school life and that how things aren't always how they seem to be like behind doors and like behind a person in general. Um, by the end of the show, we find out that the show promotes girls sticking together and building, up, building each other up instead of tearing each other down. Um, so that's the main point of the show. I'm now gonna introduce Char. Hello. I'm Charlie McCune. I am the stage manager for Mean Girls. I'm currently working with a crew of around 15 people um, coming together to put together the stage, uh, assemble props, uh, costumes, light, and sound. Uh, we've got a lot of new people this year, so we're doing a lot of learning and a lot of teaching. Um, so we're super excited to be working with Mr. Bailey for Troops 2023 production of Mean Girls. Uh, now I'd like to hand it over to uh, one of our favorite pit members, Maddie Ballou. Hi, I'm Maddie Ballou. I play the violin in the pit orchestra. There are over 30 members in the pit. Uh, we're playing a professional like Broadway level book, and we've been rehears rehearsing since February under the direction of Mr. Reddersdorf, and we, we're, we're super excited. We look, we look forward to seeing you guys there. And now I'd like to introduce Charlotte. Hi, my name is Charlotte Tan. I am Taylor Waddell, and if you don't know her, she's part of the ensemble. Um, <laughs> and we'd like to invite you guys to our show. Our show date's out um, our Thursday, uh, March 30th at 7, uh, Friday, March 31st at 7, and we have a matinee at 1 and 7 on April 1st, and a matinee at 1 um, on April 2nd, which is a Sunday. Uh, we really look forward to seeing you guys there, and I think it'll definitely be a show that everyone can enjoy, and it, it's super fun. Come see. <laughs> so one thing that's really neat about Mean Girls and Boston Spa doing Mean Girls, we are the first group in the Capital Region that will be doing um, a show of this level. And I talked to directors from the Capital Region, and many of them are excited to come and see our production to see how we are doing this production of Mean Girls. So the word's getting out that Balls and Spy is doing this new show. Uh, the rights were just released, what? Just this fall? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not even a year old before it's out there. So we would love for you to come and see our amazing production of Mean Girls. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I certainly want to um, Add an extra thanks to all the, uh, the staff members and the volunteer adults that are part of it to help support our students. Is there anything more for that recognition? That concludes res re uh, excuse me, recognition. Okay. We are now at the point in our agenda where we have the first public comment period. We do have someone signed up for public comment, as I always do. I will read our guidance for public participation at meetings. Board of Education welcomes district residents, parents, and other interested persons to its meeting. Community involvement at board meetings is encouraged so that the board can better understand and represent the views of its constituents. Please be aware, however, that information such as individual student information or particular personnel issues cannot be discussed at public sessions of the board. 
Speakers will be called upon individually. When recognized by the board president, will be asked to approach the podium, state your name and residence. Statements are restricted to a maximum of two minutes. Speakers will be notified by the board president when his or her time has expired. As I always do, once we get past the two minute mark, I will ask to please have a conclusion to your remarks. The board and the district staff take the public comment very seriously. However, the board will not respond to comments or questions during the public comment period. The board asks the public's cooperation in maintaining a safe and respectful environment, and the board president reserves the right to limit individual comments if it is deemed necessary. To achieve this, speakers will not, please, uh, please not make slanderous attacks on any group, organization, or individual, a member of the board, an employee of the district, a member of the audience, or a member of the public. All comments should be addressed to the board as a whole and not to in any individual um, board member or district employee. Please do not use profane, vulgar, threatening, or disparaging language or racial or ethnic slurs. Please do not disrupt the meeting with loud outbursts or other disruptive conduct or behavior either during the speaker's assigned time or at any other time during the meeting. Speakers understand that a failure to comply with these rules for maintaining a respectful and productive environment may result in early termination of the speaker's allotted time a denial of future requests to speak and any other actions deemed necessary by the president of the board or where appropriate in the matter of health or safety measures, the superintendent of schools. And so uh, we have signed up um, Chris Dubuque. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Chris Dubuque, Kayleen Drive. Uh, I signed up for two public comments. This for pu first public comment, I'm not here as a, so much a parent, uh, more as a member of the community uh, on behalf of the Friends of Whistle Park. Uh, I've introduced ourselves in the past, a uh, volunteer organization, just to help with, uh, you know, again, a lot of repairs and changes that needed to be made to uh, Whistle Park. In front of you is sort of a proposed map of some of the changes we're looking at implementing over the next couple of years. Uh, I was voluntold to come and speak with you uh, about a project that we're looking to do. Um, on this little map here, if you look, I know it's hard to, small, but hard to see here. This little pavilion right here is a proposed relocation of where the spring is going to be. Uh, part of the walkway in front of that for people who are visiting that spring that want to walk along that uh, little walkway, we're looking at putting pavers in there. The pavers in this school, very impressed. They've held up the test of time. So that, that's my first question. Where did you get them? Who, uh, who supplied them? Who did the installation? We would love to have that information. Uh, second of all, my daughter's here with me tonight, and this will probably won't be the first time I embarrass her, but she's sporting a sweatshirt from uh, a visit she did to Elmira College. One thing we were very impressed besides the campus there was the fact that there were various monuments that were put up. Each year, a graduating class would pitch in, donate some money, and they would have, whether it was a fountain or a statue, and it'd be dedicated to that class. One thing, we're always looking for funding. Uh, one thing we were considering that would be neat is for part of these pavers, it would be pretty neat if the school got into a tradition for each senior class of maybe you know putting together, whether it's donations through the PTA, uh, whatever the case may be, but putting together some donations uh, to, you know as these pavers need to be replaced, have one there, but have it you know dedicated by the class of uh, 2023. Um, just an idea, just a thought. Uh, so again, any feedback, any information you could provide on the route to go about doing that uh, but absolutely if you can find out who did the pavers and, and how we could get in touch with them that would be greatly appreciated uh, we're gonna have some movies in the park that just got approved uh, and we're gonna have some work days those will be posted in June you're more than welcome to come out with us get dirty and help with, with getting that park up so it'll be ready for the movies um, again it's great to see the mayor come here you know he always said if the school shares our name our village's name we should be plugged in we should be involved and I say the same you know if you're part of the school as well you know be plugged into the community even if you don't live in Boston Spa it's still a great little community come down like I said we're gonna have some great events and all hands on deck we could definitely use your help and your support thank you thank you for your comment that concludes our first
public comment period. Next, we have our student government report with our representatives, Isabel and Katie. Good evening, everyone. The senior class had a successful dodgeball tournament last week. Congratulations to the team ERM on their victory. The Pops concert this past weekend was a huge success, raising $2,400 for various senior scholarships. There were over 1,000 people in attendance. Today, the student government attended the Suburban Council Leadership Conference hosted by Saratoga High School. Next year, we will be hosting this event. The Middle School Veteran Drive is going on until Friday. The high school is collecting shampoo, deodorant, and body wash. On April 21st, we will be holding a leadership conference in Spring Fling in the high school cafeteria from 7 to 10 p.m. Tomorrow night, the class of 2024 is having a Dine to Donate event at the Speckled Pig. Dine in or take out, and a portion of that night's sales will go to the class's prom efforts. Thank you, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you very much. Any questions for our student government representatives while we got them? Thank you again, and please feel free to excuse yourselves. Next is our approval of minutes. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes for the March 1st, 2023 regular meeting? So moved. Second. Any amendments or additions? Um, I just want to make sure that I was quoted correctly. Um, Holly was quoted instead of me um, underneath the presentation uh, given by Pam. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So it sounds like we don't have any amendments or additions. Uh, not hearing any more. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The minutes are approved. Next is our superintendent's report. Uh, so first up, I have some information on our upcoming school board elections. Nominating petitions for the May 16th, 2023 school board election are available at district office between the hours of 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. The completed nominating petition and first expenditure statement are due back at district office no later than 5 p.m. Monday, April 17th, 2023. Our second piece for superintendent's report, we have Mr. Sierrani back with another budget presentation. Thank you, Dr. Duca. So tonight uh, will be a little shorter than usual and I'll explain why as we go through this, but let's move right along. Uh, we have really three items to look at our food service program, a revenues update, and a, the tax cap. So uh, a lot of things have been changing over the last few years in the school lunch program. Um, everybody know, is aware of how there was, uh, last year there was uh, free meals for everyone. Um, that was no longer funded, and then there's constant discussion in New York State and in other states about how that might be funded into the future. Um, but let's just talk about the program. It's a U.S. Department of Agriculture program. A lot of people don't understand that. It's not a, a New York State program or, or uh, something else. It's, it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, it's subsidized via reimbursement from both the federal government and the state uh, government. The federal uh, reimbursement is quite a, significantly more than the state. The state provides a small amount, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, uh, to the reimbursements. And at this district, we're unique uh, in the area because we have a contracted vendor who actually runs our program. And you can, there's two ways to really do it uh, in the state. You can, you can run the program yourself internally, or you can hire a third party. Um, uh, this, this school district, I don't know, was here before I got here, but it's, it's probably 20, 25 years has been using a third party vendor. This has uh, many advantages, quite frankly. Um, it allows the program to be run by a group of people who run these programs in multiple places. They're able, therefore, to have economies of scale for all the different things that they do. And um, it really is a professional-run program. And it, what it turns out to do, though, for the school district is, unlike a lot of school districts, we don't really need to subsidize it internally, at least not right now. So if you look at other schools, uh, you know, whether it's Burnt Hills or Saratoga or whatever, you'll see transfers into the school lunch fund, and it's a completely separate fund of money, and it's, and it's kept that way on purpose, uh, to basically keep it from 
you know, being in the red, because it, it has to stay positive, but um, that's about it. It's, it's basically, it's the closest to, the school lunch fund is the closest to a true, like, market program that uh, a school district can have. It has a profit and loss statement, and, you know, you, you win every year or you lose every year and how that goes. And, and if you're not making up the difference uh, from the cost of the program and, and what you get from reimbursement, then you have to uh, subsidize it. That means you're spending general fund money, taxpayer money, to you know run the program, uh, and we don't need to do that. And that's been great uh, here at, at, at Boston Spa. Um, so let's just talk about uh, uh, some what our history is here. So back in uh, fiscal year uh, 18 and 19, and I'm pointing, I'm I'm right here. Let's see if this thing will work for me tonight. Yeah. So right here, these were typical years, and you can see there was a bit of growth <coughs> in the sales. And what this is, is this is actually the, the total revenues of the program. And the, the blue is the federal reimbursement. The state is this little red line here. As I mentioned, the state reimbursement is very small. Here's actual sales for those kids who actually pay for the lunch. So if they pay 250, 275 back in that time. And then the small little bit of yellow is things like interest earnings and rebates and little things that the, the district might get in the program. So this was typical. Then in 2020, as you know, we had a shortened year. So that last couple months of the year went away, so the program dropped off, okay? Then in 2021, we were essentially remote and we were still providing uh, free uh, or reduced lunches to those set of kids, uh, but the program was significantly less. And you can see that the entire program practically was paid for by the federal government. There was, there was no state reimbursement and there's just a little bit, no sales at all, of course. Well, there's a tiny bit in there. Um, and then there's some other, again, with the interest earnings on the program uh, for like its, its fund balance. So then finally, here's 22, we're back to uh, a, a, a year in place, but all the meals were free this year. Okay, so remember last, last school year, so you can see the federal reimbursement was, you know, almost, you know, about two and a quarter million dollars. The state kicked in their share of that, and then this was the actual sales. Now you say, well, the meals were free, but you also have sales of a la carte items. So once a student purchases a regular lunch, they can go buy, back and buy other things. They can buy a second lunch for that matter. Um, and also they can you know, uh, uh, buy breakfasts in addition to the breakfast and et cetera. So there's a, there's a little bit of sales and of course a little bit of that extra. So really, um, you know, I'm always looking at historical data and how we did in the past to be able to predict the future and this doesn't help. Okay, so we've had a few years of just crazy stuff going on. Um, you know, if you drew a trend line like here, you'd be somewhere like that, all right? Uh, but we're, we're way off. And so when, when we get this year's results, we're going to be somewhere right in here, I assume, uh, because it's just what the trend would normally be. Uh, what does that mean? Well, what it means is, is and I want to keep pointing out the fact that the state doesn't provide a lot of money for the program. It's really a federal program, and, and the state isn't, isn't really there. So w w let's look at those percentages. And, and that really makes the point is that the federal government basically pays for 54% of the program, the state 2.7, sales about 42%, and this other is 1.8. Now there's, there's conversations about the state picking up the, uh, the, the cost to make the program free again for all students. And um, you know that is an idea, but the question is, the state would then have to come up with and, how, and the question is, is how would they ever come up with, they basically have to come up with this, all right? So it, go from 2.5% to 42%. This is hundreds of millions of dollars. And if the state's paying that, what aren't they going to pay on the other end? And where is their financial planning going on? I don't know, but that's something that uh, concerns me greatly. So what are, we, what are we, why am I talking about the food service program? I said earlier that we really haven't had to subsidize the program. But going forward, we may have to subsidize the program, and there's a couple reasons, and let's talk about that. One is, is the cost of food is, is gone up dramatically. Everybody has experienced this at home, in their own lives, well, we experience it too. Uh, you know, we use a lot of eggs. The eggs have been astronomical. Now, that, the, 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 the bird flu is over, so the prices are coming down, so hopefully that'll go away, but the, the general overall costs are still up there, and they're gonna stay up there. When we renew our contract, which is this year coming up, we, we're going to, we bid out the contract and we do this again, we know that we're gonna see a significant increase in that per meal cost that we pay that contractor. The federal reimbursement will go up, in, hopefully, in, and somehow will be based on inflation, 
so that it, it captures this large increase in food, but we can't be guaranteed of that. We don't know, the state generally hasn't raised their reimbursement in, I don't know, years and years, just by tenths of a percent or tenths of a penny or a couple pennies, so really nothing there. Um, so hopefully they'll do something. The state, you know, if they can't pick, if they can't increase the amount they're reimbursing now, how are they gonna pick up the amount for the entire free program? I'm not sure. Uh, the program does have a fund balance. Uh, we do make a profit in certain years, and um, usually what that fund balance is used for is to buy new equipment. So, for example, we just had to buy a new uh, dishwashing machine for the wood road facility. Now, this dishwasher is as long as that table there, and stuff goes in there, and it comes out on the other end, and it's a significant piece of equipment. And, and luckily, the program, our program, has the money and the fund balance in it to pay for that, those equipment updates. That's great because it doesn't cost the taxpayers and the general fund, in that sense, uh, any money. So, but if we use it up to pay for, you know, it, it, we can't use it to deal with this for very long because it's just one-time money. And it's just like the general fund. You can't use fund balance in the long run to pay for ongoing costs. And then finally, the meal price. Well, the meal price is, is you know, restricted. You can't, you, we're not going to be out there with $5 or $6 meals. Uh, about five or six years ago, the, the federal government was actually forcing school districts to increase the meal price. We were, there was a formula that they provided, and back in like 2017, 2016, you actually had to run the formula, and if you weren't at a certain level, you had to raise your prices by 10 cents or 5 cents. And we had to do that. We were, our prices were low, and we had to add those numbers. Somebody, some people asked, well, why are you raising the price? Well, we're being required to raise it by the, uh, the federal government and the formula that they have. Uh, that's not in place right now. They've waived that at this time, but we'll, undoubtedly they'll bring it back. So this is a real concern, um, and I, what I don't want to have happen is, is this to bleed into the general fund and start taking away uh, funding from that side of it. Uh, right now, I, I can't imagine uh, in, in the first year that it's going to cause a trouble, but over a couple years it could. So I wanted to bring this up. We've, we've never, I've never presented on the school lunch fund, and I don't know that anybody have seen you know, any of these any of the data relative to you know, who pays for what and how does it work. So I thought it would be useful to at least talk about that a little bit tonight. So there's that. So let's move on. Um, revenues, the revenues were, uh, it's a special year for um, the, our grants and everybody knows that. You know, so the, the federal stimulus grants that came out for uh, the COVID relief, they were uh, the two main ones and the two big ones. It's the, the CARISA and the, and the ARPA. Uh, CARISA's ending at the end of the school year. And everybody has talked about this since this came out uh, back in, started in, in late 21, that you know, this represents a fiscal cliff. You know, there's going to be an ending of this large amount of money, uh, in this case about $4 million, and something will have to be done with it. And that's something that we're grappling with right now in all other school districts. I, you know, I talk to a lot of other business officials, and you know, it, it in essentially, it cannot be incorporated into the budget. There's just too much money involved. So what we're doing is, is finding either ways to uh, change what is done or, or some of these positions and programs associated with this or is going to have to go away. And, and that's being worked on, and, and the presentation of that will be at, at our next meeting. Now, ARPA is another uh, piece of this thing, and it, ends, it doesn't end for another year. But once again, it'll provide another situation where the money's gone, and now you've got to decide what you're going to do. You know, you can't just say, well, we're going to eliminate all of what you, you could say that, well, we'll eliminate all of the ARPA money funded programs. But maybe during that time period, you found things that were more valuable than things that are currently in the budget. So what you've got to do is you've got to work on picking those things now that have been found to be the right combination. And that, that falls on the, the superintendent and the principals and, and all of the instructional folks to decide uh, what's appropriate. And, and that's, that's the, big, the big job right now. Uh, as we go into the next uh, three weeks. So not a lot there, but I wanted to remind everybody that um, under revenues that in fact those, those two grants are, are having a significant impact on our planning uh, for this year or for next year and the year after. Uh, also speaking about revenues, um, I've shown this uh, graph earlier in the year uh, that shows how much the the tax cap, the allowable tax cap allowed at the school district, how much the district actually levied and the difference. Uh, this one's a big one. Uh, I knew it was going to be. It's uh, 7%. So uh, where does that come from? Well, there's the 2% that you get for the, the tax cap. Uh, we have new growth in the district of 2.21%, so that gets added onto it. We have a, a large loss in the Global Foundries pilot 
about nine, over $900,000. That gets actually added into the cap calculation. And we're going to be issuing debt this year that will come due for the first time in next year. And the, the changes in your capital expenses also play into this. Um, so when you do all the, the, the calculations, uh, it's a 7%. And you can see that in the past, we've had some high numbers too, and you can see where we were. Uh, so I don't expect uh, a large number here, but it's, it's, it's going to be in the range of something in here because of how big this is. Uh, we, can't, we can't lose all of the money that we're losing, in a sense, and pick up all the new stuff without having some figure that's in here. But it'll be significantly less than this, and again, we'll have a, 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 multi, or a million dollar, multi-million dollar uh, amount that will not be levied. We will not have to do that. So that's good news for the, the taxpayers. Matt, do you have a question? Oh, wow. no? oh. Okay. All right. So that's, uh, that's where we are there. Um, and I think that that's it. So a short one tonight just to cover those items and know that the next meeting actually will be a big one because we're going to be going over a lot of material then. And then the following meeting, the board has to adopt the budget and we'll be doing a lot of uh, material at that point too. So uh, it's coming down to the end, but the, uh, the federal stimulus grants are, are really causing a lot of work for everybody, so we've got to get through that. Okay, any questions? Julia? Yeah, I just um, follow up questions about the lunch program, and you might not know these numbers off the top of your head, so totally understand if, um, but what percentage of our students qualify for free lunch, and what percentage of our students actually apply for it, and like what's the gap there? So um, it's about, uh, I, I should have I looked that up, but it has been, uh, over the last few years, it's about 30%. Right. All right? Yep. And um, it's much higher than surrounding schools. Yep. I mean, uh, for example, Burn Hills is less than 10%. You yep. can use that in comparison. So we have a, high, a pretty high rate for a, a district of our structure. Um, how many apply for it? Um, most do. I mean, okay. so we're probably in the 25% range that actually have applied and, and, and get, when, it, when I mean that, is apply and get approved. Yep. All right? Some yep. people apply and they just don't get approved uh, sure. based on the thing. Um, but I'll, I'll check that and I'll make sure I give you good numbers and I'll, I'll get that out to you. Thanks. But um, it, it went up dramatically. I know that uh, back in, uh, like the, the 2000s, 2010, 2005, in that range, we were in low, like 19, 20%. And then after the, um, the, the big market, uh, the, the, the mortgage collapse in 2008, 9, it started to really go up, and in the last few years it's gone up, and that's why we're, we're at 30, 35. At one point we were almost 40%, I think, a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's gone back down a little bit. Okay, thanks. I have right. one last follow-up sure. question about lunches. Um, do we do do students run a lunch debt, or would we ever not feed a kid because they have no? It's lunch it's debt? not it's not legal in New York State to okay. not feed a kid, so kids will have uh, large amounts of debt, um, and that has to be collected to the degree that we can. Uh, it can't be discussed with the students. It has to be discussed with the parents. It's completely on the parents' responsibility to make those payments. If they aren't making the payments, we make sure that they've applied for the free and reduced loans to see if they're eligible. Mm -hmm. um, and that is one area where over the last few years we have had to, we're to subsidize the program in the sense that the federal government requires any unpaid debt to be paid for from outside of the fund. Now we could have absorbed it with our fund balance and not done anything, but you're not allowed to do that anymore. In fact, about 10 years ago you could do that. And they changed the rules on that, and now we have to transfer money over from the general fund to pay that because it's a requirement. I mean, the last few years it's been nothing. I mean, I, I, I don't sure. mean to make a joke, but last year it was $4. It was $4.40, sure. I think. It was so small. A couple years before that, it was almost $16,000. Yep. So it's going all over the place, um, and that could grow. Uh, too and be a problem for us and it is a problem for a lot of school districts across the country but New York State won't won't really allow any other process to go on they, they eliminated all of the processes I mean I, I know in the in the, the late 90s and some of the school districts where I was that that people would be using uh, collection agencies and things like this and and you remember the the alternate meal which was even up until four years ago you could do the alternate meal thing where if a student wasn't paying for lunch they got the cheese sandwich that's no longer allowed you must give them a full lunch uh, regardless of the level of their their lunch debt Good. Um, 
And last follow-up question. Oh, yeah, you said that before. I right? know, I did. It's the mom in me, the mm -hmm. food thing. That, it just activates. Um, would a kid know their debt? I mean, obviously, <coughs> right? Like, um, not from us. Okay. We, we can't tell them. We okay. can't say anything at the register. We can't do anything. Okay. Um, but they could find out from their parents. That's fair. Um, I mean, we have instances. I mean, it's, it's not as clean as it seems. I mean, we'll have instances where the parents will be giving the kid money. The kid will be spending it on something else. Who knows? And then we call and they're like, oh, okay, and then they take care of that. That's totally fair, okay. too. But <laughs> yeah, they've got to, they'll take care of that pretty quickly. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, other questions? I have a couple. So regarding next year, trying to project for the lunch program, are you sharing that we will probably budget um, for the typical 2018, 2019 year, where we think that our amount of contribution would be minimal. Are you saying that you're possibly looking at an unfunded mandate again, where there's going to be you have to give free lunches, but we may have to have uh, general fund monies go into it, and you're going to plan for that? Um, just where are you where so, are you going? So I think that the range of what could happen could be accommodated within our current structure. One is with our fund balance. One within the increase that I expect from the federal government reimbursement because of inflation and because of the small amount of whatever we are able to, to increase the, uh, the meals, and possibly a small uh, uh, general fund contribution, but you know, other than the, the unpaid lunches, no. So we're okay for one year, and that's what the, the assumption is for 24, to answer your question directly. We're but assuming that there will come down that it will be free meals. No, 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 oh. I'm not suggesting there's gonna be free meals. I, I'm, I don't think there's gonna be. I think that what we're going to do is we're going to be we're going to be back. So it's um, going to be more of a typical 2018, 2019 yes, year, only, and that's what you're going to project right, but for. In those years, the school district made money on the program. It might, it might have been only thirty or forty thousand dollars, but it broke even or made a profit. In this scenario, it'll be the same, but because the cost of the contract will be so high relative to the increased cost in food and labor, for that matter. One of the problems that the, our vendor has had is getting people to work for the vendor because the wages were so low. All right. Again, we've used the example that you can go out and you can get the you get some money at, at, a, at a fast food place that's 16, 18, you know, dollars. Same situation. They had to raise wages, and 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 we actually went through a wave of that. Um, so that'll go up again, and so all of that's going to put pressure on the program to, you know, find another way out. And it's not just going to be us. I mean, it's going to be everybody. Even if you run your own internal program, you, you, find, you face the same issues. Uh, you're still going to have higher food costs. You're going to have higher labor costs. And will the federal government you know, address it? What will New York State do? And, and how would they ever pay for what the proposals are? Or maybe they just raise their reimbursement. I mean, that's a, you know, there's an intermediary step there. You don't have to go from almost nothing to, oh, we're going to subsidize the whole thing. How about an intermediate step and just raise your reimbursement so that we're not all stuck? Mm -hmm. uh, that's hard, sometimes that's hard to get through down, down in Albany. Um, so anyways, I hope that answers your question. It does. And then lastly, I just want to share again, and please correct my math, but everyone should keep in mind that there's the allowable um, amount, which you know is the is the two percent max, but as you said, there are things that get added into that, so it ends up being higher. And you, mm -hmm. you showed the historical data for us. The tax levy is what the district the district increase basically in what we're asking for in terms of tax revenue. Mm -hmm. But the actual number that someone may see in their tax bill is impacted by either the increase or the decrease in the tax base exactly for the the town and, and vill the towns that make up our school district so that number that we talk about as the increase in the tax um, levy that may not be what the actual taxpayer will see as either in, as an increase or, or, or decrease or stays the same for their tax bill. Well, I, I can say definitively that the on the average it will not be that much because so for example this year our in in, in that calculation of that seven percent we saw the largest increase in new construction in Saratoga County that and it was two point two percent so you can basically take that off so if you had a three percent tax rate and there were no uh, nothing else changed you would have minus that 2.2 .2. 
But there are other things that go on, there, but none of them are on the scale of that. I mean, that's a large scale change. Um, mm -hmm. You'll have things like uh, commercial properties will do the Article 7 hearings and try to get their property lowered, and that will lower the tax base in that sense. But it's, a, it's small things, it's, it's, it, for, you know, relatively speaking. You know, 2.2% in the whole tax base is large, and you just have to drive around our district. We capture a lot of that things that are happening uh, within the bounds of the district, a lot of the construction that you see. So, yeah, I mean, there are school districts uh, in the region that have zero increase in their tax base. And, and typically, it only would be a few tenths of a percent, and we're over two. So that's significant. Um, you know, what does it mean? Uh, it's some of its commercial property, some of its houses, so that means more kids, so that, that you know, is, is, you know, uh, an expense on the other side of that. But it certainly will be, on average, it's less. It's just, there are so many, as you remember from my presentation a year ago, there's so many other things that come into play individually, both in terms of each town and each homeowner, that it won't ever have exactly the average, but you get an average. I remember it well last okay, year when good. you talked about the, the towns, I think it's the tax rate that the yes. town sets, yeah, well, the tax are. rate that each town sets and how that comes into play as well. I just want to get the point out that when we talk about the increase, percentage increase in the tax levy, that is not necessarily the percentage increase that a taxpayer will pay. Yes. Okay, anything else? That's all I have. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. And is there anything more that from the superintendent? The superintendent's report. report. Okay, committee reports is next, and I believe we have a policy committee report. Yes, the policy committee met today at six o'clock in room 200, and um, we reviewed old business of the special ed policy audit that um, Mrs. Jensen did for the district and um, there are no changes that need to be made and we are in compliance with all of our special education policies. We had a discussion, a brief discussion, about policy 8320 and 8330 um, and reviewing and potentially adding criteria for all instructional and library material into those policies. Um, we revised the wellness policy and what we did was make it a little easier for people to bring in store-bought snacks. There's going to be a list sent out to all parents um, by the end of the year for next year or at the beginning of next year of store-bought items that you are going to be able to bring as long as they have FDA um, ingredients listed, FDA approved ingredients listed. And that list is going to be district-wide so um, that's a great change for the policy. The first read of that, the first 28-day read, is going to be on April 5th, and the vote will be May 17th. And the last policy we talked about and revised was 8280, the ELL proficiency instruction, and all that was added to that was translation services was added to the policy. Everything else is staying the same. And they cross-referenced it with policy number 7611, um, ch the Children's with Dil Children with Disabilities Act. And the first read for that is also on April 5th, and the vote for that will be 28 days, more than 28 days later, um, May 17th. Any questions? Thank you very much. Any other committee report? Next up is uh, correspondence. Correspondence to the district. Uh, we have four emails this time, one regarding uh, traffic pattern at the middle school and three regarding student matters. Okay, and since the last meeting, the board has received five emails. Two were follow-up emails regarding stop school buses, vehicles illegally passing the stop school buses and stop arm cameras. One was a follow-up email regarding the bilingual program. One was email regarding the Wellness Expo and board uh, participation and support for that. And one email regarding the Yucatan Science Department trip. Announcements. Mr. Williams. Good evening. 
in addition to all the other things you heard about earlier, um, we do have our robotics team heading out to Rochester this weekend. Some of them actually have left, some will leave tomorrow um, for the Finger Lakes Robotics Tournament, and they'll compete out there for the next few days. Um, so you'll see some updates coming back through. Some of the sessions are actually um, broadcast live, so if you're interested in watching the, the, the robots and, and the rumbling, then you can watch that over the, the next coming days. Um, our Science Olympiad team is heading off to Lemoyne College in Syracuse, so they'll be out there competing at the state level as well um, this weekend. So we'll get out whatever updates we can from that um, when we get them. Um, next Wednesday night, we have a district-wide program here in the library um, from our district health and wellness team, um, the focus on substance use, education, and prevention programming. And there's three different sessions, and we have two different um, outside folks coming in um, to do some of those presentations. And that'll begin here again on, on the 22nd at 6.30 p.m. Um, we will be live streaming the first two sessions of that, um, similar to how we do the, the board meetings. And then you heard from the, the high school students, their, their play Mean Girl starts on the 30th and goes through April 2nd, and your next meeting's on the 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay, old business uh, from the district. Old business. Okay, not hearing any. We're on to new business. I have a motion to approve resolution number 466, adoption 2023-2024 district calendar. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ye yes, one discussion. Um, just wanted to make note um, as a reminder to please uh, review religious holidays when um, we're scheduling meet the teacher nights or any important events. I do see that these um, that this calendar did avoid them, um, especially starting on, on those days, but just wanted to make note of that, of how important it is for family involvement on those um, particular events. Thank you, and uh, I was just gonna actually ask um, if there was anything of note in the calendar from my review. It seemed to be relatively standard. We're starting um, after the uh, Labor Day weekend um, this year, but was there anything of, of note? Uh, we added an additional superintendent's conference day uh, for October 20th, which will line up well with a couple of our elementary cycles. Um, and instead of having the four half-day teacher conferences in a row, we split those up to do two and two from back-to-back -back weeks. Any question? Yeah, yes. one, um, Dr. Duca, so we plan 183 days in our, and we have to do at least 180. I'm just kind of regurgitating from my memory here. Um, the other three are planned like snow days. Um, and then if we don't use those, what do we have uh, alternative plans for? Is that the Friday before Memorial Day or anything like that? We don't, we don't have anything official uh, as, of, as of yet, as of now. Um, okay. We don't typically you know, do a give back, but. Um, we just figure out, play it by ear? Yeah, yeah okay. like this year we've, we've almost, ex you know, almost have to use all our snow days. So, uh, we'll, yeah, we kind of play it by ear. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 466 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 467, Board of Education Policy Manual File 7310, Code of Conduct. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 467 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 468, settlement. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 468 passes. Resolution number 469, State Environmental Quality Review, CECRA. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I just want to note for our members that we have to do a roll call vote on this, so I will be asking each individually. Uh, and I, I'll just call your name and please um, share how you vote, uh, either approval 
uh, not approval or um, abstention. So, Mr. Ryan? Approved. Mr. Terbiak? Aye. Mr. Dreher? Approved. Ms. Barker Flynn? Approved. Dr. Ralph Fort Baskin? Approved. Ms. Woodmore? Approved. And I am approved as well. Resolution number 469, CICRA passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 470, State Environmental Quality Review, CICRA. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Just sharing that there are two resolutions because we need to do this for two different projects at two different locations. And again, we need a roll call vote. Please, Mr. Ryan. Approved. Mr. Terbiak? Aye. Mr. Dreher? Approved. Ms. Barker Flynn? Approved. Dr. Robert Baskin? Approved. Ms. Whitmer? Approved. And I approve as well. Resolution number 470 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 471, internal audit. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 471 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 472, agreement, professional services. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 472 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 473, <coughs> agreement, professional services. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 473 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 474, agreement, professional services. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 474 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 475, agreement, professional services. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 475 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 476, agreement, professional services. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 476 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 477, establish award. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 477 passes. Thanks to those who are establishing this award. I have a motion to approve resolution number 478, scholarship change. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Resolution number 478 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 479, award of bid, general construction, electrical, HVAC, and plumbing projects. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Resolution number 479 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 480, placement of students with disabilities. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Resolution number 480 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 481, placement of preschool students with disabilities. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 481 passes. Resolutions number 482 through 487 are recognized as a consent agenda for the purpose of Board of Education action. 
I have a motion to approve the consent agenda resolutions number 482 through 487. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The consent agenda resolutions number 482 through 487 passes. And I'd like to have a congratulations for Ms. Pam Motler for her appointment to a new assistant superintendent position. It is well earned and uh, we appreciate what you do. And um, we're glad that uh, you have this new uh, position. Do we have any other new business from the district? No, from the board? No new business. We are at the second period for public comment. Thank you. And the same guidance uh, pertains as um, from the first uh, period and First up is uh, Jason Severia. Please come to the podium, state your name and address, and address the board as a whole, please. Good evening. My name is Jason Severia. I live at 936 State Route 67. Um, before I get started, I know you're all probably sick of hearing what I have to say. Um, I just want to remind you that I have two young daughters, one of which will be attending this high school next year. Um, they are my motivation, and I would fight just as hard for your children as I do for mine. Um, the WSWHE BOCES, which is the Washington, Saratoga, Warren, Hamilton, Essex Board of Cooperative Educational Services, serves 31 school districts in a five-county region. The BOCES Board of Education, a governing board made up of representatives from component school districts, is responsible for the oversight of curricular, financial, and other policy de decisions. Jason Furneaux, the president of our Board of Education, is an active board member at the WSWHE BOCES with his term ending on June 30th, 2024. Within the WSWHE BOCES is an entity or a council called WSWHE School Library System. This entity has a council with sitting members. Two of these council members are employed right here at Boston Spa Central School District. And I have the page from their website if you'd like to look. <coughs> this is their mission statement. The WSWHE school library system empowers lifelong learners by providing vision, leadership, professional development, and other services, facilitating access to all forms of quality information resources, and sharing best ideas and practices. Sheila McIntyre holds a title on this council as Large District 2000 Plus. Sheila McIntyre is also employed at Boston Spa Central School District as a librarian for Milton Terrace Elementary School. The acting administrator of this council is Kathleen Skelly. Kathleen Skelly is also employed in Boston Spa School Central School District as the director of curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Now here's where things get a little corrupted. Kathleen Skelly also held the title as review committee chair on the very committee that decided the outcome of a request for review of library materials relating to the book Gender Queer. This requ request for review was submitted by me for containing pornography back in May of 2022. Kathleen Skelly and the remaining anonymous committee members denied my request to have the book removed from our library. This is the letter please. that I was sent informing me of the denial by the committee signed by Kathleen Skelly, review committee chair. 
I'm definitely not the most intelligent person in this room right now, and I can still see the egregious actions that a handful of the staff in this district has meddled in. This is corrupt, this is fraud, and this is complete negligence. We cannot have the people in charge of putting these books on our school shelves also be the arbitrator of our grievances. Now I'll end with this. I was also denied a FOIL request for the committee members' names, how they voted, and the minutes of the meetings. And now I know why. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Thank you for your comments. Next, Chris Dubuque. <clears throat> Chris Dubuque, Kayleen Drive. I wanted to, again, revisit something I brought up multiple times uh, that was also introduced by this board. And, uh, you know, as Mr. Severia uh, clearly is, is upset with some of the materials in this library. He's not the only one. There's many of us, uh, both within our organization for New York Informed, uh, just as, as well as parents in the district. Uh, and again, it's something that we don't look at the book and say, all right, we're going to take your word for it. My wife actually thoroughly read through the book, and there's some disturbing, I mean, it's just disturbing content. There's been other books brought to our attention as well, and, and she does her due diligence and God bless her, reads through every single page and says, you know, okay, this one's, I can understand your concern, but I can see how this was able to be put on a shelf in the library. Now, again, I keep mentioning gender queer because that is just outrageous that that's still in this library. Uh, again, if it goes in the public library, that's a public library, but, you know, a school library where, you know, again, my son was able to borrow books from when he was in the middle school. Um, you know, that, that is concerning. And I've got a daughter here as well. And it's definitely uh, something that, you know, there should be a third party uh, review based on that. Uh, again, this was news to me of the people who reviewed it. But again, you know, there should be a, a third party review. And one thing I brought up in the past was board parent committees. I really think that's important. Uh, to have that interaction. I know there's the building leadership team, but I still think board parent committees, and I would even suggest maybe you have a lot of young minds here that are here probably, uh, you know, they got April 1st to get their uh, homework in for macroeconomics and their seal of civic readiness, but I imagine you probably have some great opinions and insight just from a lot of the young minds sitting behind me. So I'd even throw, I'd add into that. I, I don't know what the you know, and there seems to be a hesitancy to want to put these committees together. I, it'd be a first. I don't know of other schools that are doing it, but I think it would definitely benefit this school. And I would even suggest maybe adding, and, and it could be a requirement for civil civic readiness as well, uh, adding some of the students in on that as well, uh, just to get their insight as well. Uh, I just think that would be, uh, you know, very valuable, whether it's content in the library. Um, I know there was some concern last year with the masking. Uh, and, fact it was in this library a lot of students stepped up and said no we're, we're done with it and part of the reason why they did that was they were just frustrated that their parents voices weren't heard and a lot of them felt like their voices weren't heard so they sort of took it in their own hands and it was amazing to see and uh, hopefully Dr. Dukey you never are interviewed by my daughter but she she put the uh, last superintendent held his feet to the fire and asked some amazing questions uh, shocked me even so again don't don't discount the future leaders uh, and I think that would be great to have something like that where they could get involved uh, and have an act of uh, say in w what happens within their school uh, so again I'll keep coming I'll keep pitching it and I, I have hope that we'll definitely see something like that put together uh, hopefully some, someday soon. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. That concludes our second public comment session. Do we have anyone here from our associations? Uh, <clears throat> our high school PTSA is our representative here. No. Um, PTA. All right, uh, so Wood Road Carnival is coming up on Saturday, March 25th. Those interested in volunteering to help with the event can contact the PTA with how they can help. Uh, also, the Gordon Creek Talent Show is coming up on Friday, March 31st at 6 p.m. All are invited to come watch Gordon Creek students show off their special talents. There's 84 of them this year. 84, so. oh my goodness. But I've been instructed two hours. We're going to make it work. Excellent. <laughs> A lot of talent, talent in Gordon Creek this year. <laughs>
That's all. Thank you. Okay. I have a bark update. Uh, they are looking for additional board members, so I'm just putting it out there to the community that if you're interested in serving and giving back, um, the Boston Area Rec Commission is looking for you. Anything else? <clears throat> okay. Um, that concludes our meeting. We do have reason to adjourn to executive session. We will not be returning to open session after the executive session. Can I have a motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss the employment of particular persons and to discuss collective bargaining negotiations with the Teachers Association? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned to executive session.